No, I did not. Okay. Here we are. Um, I've resumed the recording, folks. Thank you. Um, we'll be able to share this with you all after the session so that you can share it within your public health associations or with other colleagues that may want to um, hear about what we'll talk about today. All righty. So first, um, I wanted to say that um, a little bit about who I am and why I'm talking to you right now um, and introduce our wonderful speakers for today. Um, my name is Raya, my pronouns are she, her, and I work at the American Public Health Association. Um, I work on this project, particularly as the Grassroots and Communications Program Manager. Um, folks who are here, um, you're welcome to introduce yourself in the chat, your name, organization, and pronouns if you're comfortable sharing those. Um, just to get a chance to kind of see who's here and, and who else is on the call. Um, it's my pleasure to, uh, to welcome both Adam and Petra. Um, Adam Snipes works, Adam's work focuses primarily on Oklahoma, where he currently serves as the state campaigns consultant for the Local Solutions Support Center. Adam serves on the boards of the National Center for Transgender Equality, the Oklahoma City County Health Department, and the Partners in Public Health Foundation. He operates a consulting practice focused on coalition building, commanding community action, driving earned media, analyzing public policy, direct project management, and campaign execution. Adam's work has been published in the American Political Science Review and Time Magazine. Um, so Adam does a lot of work. <laughs> Moral of the story, Adam's doing a lot of stuff. Um, Petra is as well, so I'm, I'm pleased to introduce Petra Morrison. Um, Petra is a state campaigns consultant for LSSB as well. Um, Petra brings a background in both exercise science and health behavior change, combined with their experience in the service industry and organizing the, to the policy and campaign space. Um, driven by a desire to address health inequities through upstream approaches, Petra's work makes the connection of policy and its consequential health outcomes as accessible and approachable as possible to all people. Um, working with community organizers, volunteers, and advocates and fellow scientists of various disciplines has broadened the scope of this work to address the strain that unfettered capitalism has wrecked upon the dimensions of health and low income, um, Black, Indigenous, and LGBTQ communities. So um, thank you for Adam and Petra for joining us today and welcome to them. Um, just wanted to give a brief introduction to kind of who we are and, and again, why I'm here speaking to you today. Um, at APHA, Affiliate Affairs um, and the Alliance teams have been working with national level partners who you can see here, pictured here, um, to support the efforts of state affiliates to advance um, public health. We work closely with our partners at LSSC, obviously, um, Act for Public Health and the American Heart Association and their state representatives on this project. Just gonna quickly check the chat here. It seems like folks are introducing themselves. So thank you for that. Um, I wanted to just take a moment to give um, a brief plug as a part of this project, we've developed a series of informative sessions, um, just like the one we're about to embark on today. Um, these sessions are developed to address the topics that affiliates have identified that they would like to learn more about. If there's a topic that you'd like us to cover, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, even if you wanted to put it in the chat, I'm happy to download that and look through it. Um, but hopefully by this point, I've emailed you enough <laughs> uh, that you have my email as well, but I will put it in the chat too. Um, just wanted to give a quick reminder that we have a wonderful session um, coming up on December 7th about distinguishing lobbying, advocacy, and education, um, and the future sessions listed here include communications, discussion of the 2020 legislative trends, 2022 legislative trends, sorry, um, power mapping, and media training. So definitely some exciting sessions if you can join us for those. Um, on that note, I am going to pass it over to Petra and Adam, and we'll come back together, oopsie, at the end there for Q&A. Hi, everybody. It's so nice to see so many familiar faces on this call. Um, I'm not just familiar with some of you from EPHA, but from other calls, which have just been 
you know, throughout my, my span of organizing and doing work. So I'm very grateful to be here and humbled to be here um, with my partner, Adam, at LSSC to kind of share some insights of what um, we've experienced uh, from the field um, in organizing and in approaching um, policies. Um, so with that being said, uh, while we do not have slides, I want this to be more of like an engaging space. So if you happen to have any questions or comments, um, please put those into the chat for now, um, just so that we're sharing the space as best as we can. I know when we're in mixed spaces, um, we have certain folks who just, they're really enthusiastic and they can speak a lot. Um, and I want to make sure everybody's voice is heard as much as possible. Um, so we're just going to also throw this out here that we want to acknowledge that everybody is at a different point in time um, in their advocacy in their stages of advocacy. Um, and even though we're all in different stages of our advocacy, um, and while some of this content might seem like a bit of a throwback for some of you in your earlier days, um, it's, it's a good reminder that listening and exploring and collaborating with one another while revisiting information with others gives us new perspective and shares allows us to share the knowledge of, of those who've been there before. Um, and additionally, uh, we want to continue to explore uh, the various ways to engage with these issues, even if you're facing backlash um, from the folks on the ground here in Arizona and the folks on the ground in other states and my partners in other states. Um, we know that this is not easy work and it can be really intimidating, but through coalition building and collaborating and partnership building, um, you know, that backlash is a little bit less intimidating. Uh, when we do it strategically, uh, we can kind of reduce that, back, that uh, backlash and really kind of focus more so on narrative shifting, which Adam and I will definitely go into as well. Um, and we also want to acknowledge the potential shifts that have come about in the election. Um, I know that in Arizona, um, we've had some pretty incredible wins on a lot of fronts. Um, but as somebody who's been doing this work for a while, um, I know that just because somebody has a D or R next to their name does not necessarily mean that they're going to be friendly to all of the things that we need to get done in the name of um, true health justice. And so I'm um, being strategic and knowing like where those people are coming from. Uh, power mapping, which is something we're going to get into, looking at finance reports, which is a lot of the stuff that I do as well, to really understand where a person's coming from. Um, you know, that's really important to kind of like dive into as well. Um, so yeah, uh, moving forward, um, we're going to continue to speak on message framing, um, power mapping, partnerships and, and coalition building, um, and dive deeper into those, those subjects. And so uh, key aspects that we often want to include in our approach are those things, but we're going to need to kind of like lay that kind of out, you know, with you. Uh, message framing, that like, what does that even mean? <laughs> narrative shifting, like, what does that even mean? Um, narrative shifting and message framing are really just very jargony ways of saying that you want to know your audience. Um, you want to know where they stand on the issues, or at least have an idea of where they stand on the issues prior to engaging with them. Um, we have a very mixed audience now. I, I know that you all care about public health. That's one thing I can absolutely say that you all care about public health, but all of you care about it from like a different perspective, right? Um, and usually taking time to kind of investigate uh, where that person might be coming from includes um, looking them up knowing who you're going to have a conversation with before you have that conversation online or in person. Um, so that way, you know, like, hey, like, this is going to be a valuable um, use of our time. Um, and I'm going to actually get the things that I need to get done in this conversation, um, because I've used all the tools that have been given to me. Um, you'll have a variety of talking points, right? Um, but you'll always want to make sure that you're going to keep that message the, the same while shifting the language and the words that you use. Um, and that's not to betray our goals or the long lasting solutions that are founded in community driven answers, but it is to build those relationships. And it is going to be building relationships with those who are trying to shift narratives with. Um, resources that come from partners that we have at the national level who've done the research. There's a lot of folks who've done messaging research. Um, Adam and I talk a lot about the resources that we have at Local Solution Support Center on um, messaging guidance. Um, those have been used by me in the past and partners on the ground in Arizona. 
Um, and it doesn't always mean that we're going to use it exactly like it's been given to us, but it gives us an idea of like where we need to kind of start off, right? Like it gives us a baseline. Cool. This is awesome. Our work is really in pushing the narrative in a progressive lens. Sometimes the resources we're giving don't really give us that but it does help us meet where those moderates are at. It also can kind of help us meet where those conservatives are at, which I know we're working on diligently at the national level. Um, a lot of you folks have reached out on that. Um, and then making sure that those resources aren't just, be utilized, aren't just being utilized by yourself or your progressive partners, but understanding that like messengers are really important. I've been on so many different calls where they've talked about um, these amazing quotes. There's an amazing quote from Barack Obama. Um, and you're, you're going to hear this quote, right? And you're going to, you're going to agree with it most likely, because regardless of how you feel about Barack Obama, you can see that there were certain things that he did that were really great for, say, public health or um, economic justice, right? And it turns out that the quote's actually misattributed to him, but it was something that was uh, stated by Vladimir Putin, right? <laughs> So I could go in and I could say all the things that I want to say about public health, how I care about it, right? But if you put me in a room with a lot of older white male legislators, they're probably not going to care about what I have to say. And it is unfortunate that that is a tool that we have to utilize, but it does get the work done. So making sure that your partners um, are already already have established relationships is very important. And if they don't have established relationships, you continue to look in your, um, you look in your social economy and the workers that you have here on the ground in the states that you're in or at the national level to kind of understand, okay, someone's been there before, what can we learn from them? How can we put that um, into actual action on the ground and make sure that we're reaching the person where they're at? and understanding that these values, they may not be fully aligned, but we're gonna get that person to that particular place um, over time. And so I know like our partners at the league here in Arizona, they're great. <laughs> like, I know that I can trust that if they're in a room, they're gonna, they're gonna shift a lot of that narrative with the people at the legislature. I can't really have that kind of relationship with them with some of my grassroots partners. And so, they will definitely, you know, build that out. They'll definitely kind of give that out um, and, and say, hey, we're going to share this power um, with our partners at the league or with our partners in other um, positions because we've had backroom conversations, we've had internal conversations, and now you're going to be in the room and they're going to receive the message from you um, a lot clearer than us. Um, and also acknowledging that that is like really crummy, right? I want to hold space for that. That's crummy, that we have to use that but that is just the way things are right now. And in order for us to get things shifted and changed, again, those relationships need to be fostered. Um, and media outlets. Um, I'm very fortunate because I know a lot of journalists uh, from my youth. Uh, a lot of people I grew up with became journalists. Um, a lot of Latinos in the, the Phoenix community and Tucson community said, no, we want to, we want to share our stories, right? Um, but you need to utilize your resources and those community members that you have in uh, media outlets uh, a little realistically and strategically. Um, we don't want you getting burned. Um, we've seen a lot of anti-trans legislation come out, and we've seen a lot of very important um, journalist outlets, media outlets, perpetuate a lot of the false narratives that we have about what the trans community experiences. Um, and so constantly having those conversations of who's a trusted media um, resource, can we make sure that we're reaching the audiences that we need to reach and making sure that the messenger, again, is the best messenger to have um, on that particular issue. So that way the words land and they plant the seeds of the work that we're trying to do. Um, and again, all of this is to say, this is utilizing your social economy, but you also want to start building out that social economy. And so we move into something called power mapping. And I cannot wait to turn this over to Adam because I'm excited to hear Adam's uh, insights and take on what power mapping looks like in his state and what he's done, um, because it's, it's like one of my favorite strategic things to do. So Adam, we're going to pass it on over to you to, to talk a little bit more about that. Awesome. Thanks, Petra. Hey, everybody. My name's Adam. I use he, him pronouns, um, and I live in Oklahoma City. 
I've been doing progressive and democratic organizing in Oklahoma since 2006. So you have to know that I am an optimist. <laughs> I'm still doing this work since 2006. Um, our election results were really rough. Um, our governor um, was reelected with double digit, um, you know, support. And we thought that um, it, it could have been likely that he would have lost his, his governorship. Um, unfortunately, that did not come to happen. Um, and that matters to us specifically in the public health space and the public health authority space, um, because in two years ago, two previous legislative sessions, um, he championed along with two legislative leaders, a piece of legislation that would have taken over our local city county health departments and put them under state control. Um, and he did that in response um, to, um, you know, he, he felt like they, the, that response would have been better handled if it had been under the State Department of Health. Um, and he didn't enjoy that he didn't have a direct chain of command over our um, Oklahoma City and Tulsa Health Departments. Um, just a little note, the Tulsa and Oklahoma City Health Departments are funded through local property taxes um, collected by the county, so it's different than in most states. And we're also appointed by the, the mayors and the county commissioners. So it's very much locally funded for the local community and um, overseen in governance strategy by our local elected officials. Um, so that's just a little bit of context for you all of the state of play of things in Oklahoma. Um, you know, before we kind of really dive into the power mapping, I do just want to note um, in CSL, the National Conference of State Legislatures is a great resource because they will track all of the legislative leadership elections that are happening right now. Um, we're all very busy trying to do our public health work. It's flu season. You can hear my voice, I'm sick. Um, so we don't have time to be like also watching what's going on at the state legislature. Um, so I just encourage you all to use NCSL as much as possible, or SIX is another organization, the State Innovation Exchange. Um, and they track legislative um, elections so that you know who your Senate and House leadership are gonna be, both minority and majority party, um, as well as committee leadership. And then they also track your legislative calendar. Um, and just as we start going into the winter and everybody's taking holiday breaks, well-deserved holiday breaks, this is when pre-filing starts in a lot of states. So this is when legislation and ideas, bad ideas, start getting handed to policy analysts and the policy analysts in the state capital start writing them up. So it's just a really important time to be watching that uh, pre-filing process and seeing what's getting filed. Um, for me and in my state, we have a certain, um, you know, there are certain folks that we know tend to introduce harmful legislation. Um, so instead of looking at, you know, all 3,000 pieces of legislation that are going to get filed and trying to analyze that and trying to guess what um, bizarre words they're going to use to scrape away rights from people, because they're really clever um, and how they frame things. That way our legislative trackers can't catch it. I, I do that, yes. I do the search terms and all that, and I try to guess. Um, but I also just like to look at my usual suspects and just look at anything that they're filing. Um, so, so knowing who those folks are and then knowing which committee your legislation is likely to go through is also really helpful because then you could just watch anything that um, is likely to come through that committee. Um, we talked about setting up tripwires with good search terms on legislative tracking. Um, LSSC has some re reports and resources. We have a legal team and we do that in cooperation with our partners like APHA and other folks, American Heart Association, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so if you ever need any resources, um, you know, it's likely that we're probably already tracking within your state. Um, so ask us and we can figure out, you know, um, how to cohort and align on those things that way we're not duplicating effort. Um, watch the committee calendars, like I said, and then also watch budget negotiations. So I live in Oklahoma. Uh, like I mentioned, this is a state where, um, you know, they held hostage American Rescue Plan dollars in order to get rid of gender affirming care um, at one of our major university medical systems. They held hostage $40 million. Um, so they use money often 
um, to coerce. And, you know, I believe money is an expression of our values, right? So um, I really like to watch budget negotiations, what sort of horse trading is going on. Um, they'll also start playing with expenditures around uh, Medicare money and things like that. Um, so I'm sure you all are used to watching budget negotiations and tracking being in uh, public health advocacy. Um, so just a note on that. On power mapping, uh, Petra mentioned a little bit of the cloak and dagger scandal type house of cards stuff, which really, it seems like that, but really it's all public record. Um, so when I'm going in and I'm trying to figure out, you know, how does this senator who's a legislative leader run his campaign? Who does he listen to? I love to see where his money is and who's it's coming, who it's coming from. Because in Oklahoma, we have quite a few legislators who are supported by other legislators. They kind of run in cliques or miniature caucuses within the Republican Party. Because that's how many Republicans there are. So kind of knowing where those fault lines are is really helpful. Um, and knowing who is controlling um, those clicks of votes uh, can be helpful because the order in which we talk to people is really important. I also like to look and see if they've been elected to an, another office previously. So were they previously a city council member? Were they previously a county commissioner? What sort of relationships do they have a, as a result of that? I also like to look at their biographical influences. So like our governor, Governor Stick, graduated from OSU. So he often does projects in alignment with Oklahoma State University. Um, so I just like to look at, you know, what institutions would be really influential on somebody like a governor's state or the Senate legislative leader, like I just mentioned. On the biological and biographical influences, I also like to consider, and you have to play this hand thoughtfully, um, but I like to look at their faith leader and what their faith leader and their church say, again, Oklahoma. Um, and then I also like to look at their family um, and not so much kids, but like wife, how did they, a lot, of, sorry, I'm uh, presuming heteronormativity because Oklahoma, but like a lot of our legislative leaders are men who are married to women, right? Um, so I just like to know a little bit about their story because um, it helps me understand what their own story of self might be. It's just about curiosity. The final thing that I look at is their volunteer mapping. Some candidates like to pay their own way. They don't collect a bunch of money from people. They'll just sit down and they'll write themselves a check, they'll self-finance and then they're done. Other candidates, you know, put it together $25 at a time and they're much more thoughtful and intentional about the way they engage. That also just gives me an insight to how the person thinks. Now that I kind of know who our legislative leader is, what committee that we're going to, Again, in Oklahoma, we tend to play defense. Maybe you're working offense on a bill. That's totally possible too. We do a lot of offense on uh, tobacco smoking cessation. But then I think about who do we need to talk to and what order do we need to talk to them in? Um, because sometimes in order to get the person who's controlling a lot of votes, it's helpful to have the people under them come to them and say, hey, we wanna do this. instead of trying to go to the person who controls the votes. And then I think about how to persuade them, which is a lot of the messaging research that we talk about. But then I also just think about the messengers. You know, is there a hospital CEO in their district that they know that they would be surprised if like, you know, the director of the largest hospital in their district came and showed up and they, were, they thought, oh, this is just a small public health bill and we're in a turf war with the local health department. And then suddenly a hospital CEO shows up and is like, hey buddy, you're messing with my little friend here, don't do that. Um, that changes the power dynamic really, really quickly. Um, so those are the things that I like to think about when I think about power mapping. Um, I also like to think about an inside strategy and an outside strategy, which that kind of puts us on the edge of um, earned media. But like, I like to kind of give an inside strategy, like, hey, we're gonna work this out under the dome between you, me, the lobbyists, you know, all of that before we start talking about this publicly, because we wanna give ourselves some room um, to escalate if necessary. And all of this while watching the calendar, looking to see, are we about to hit a committee deadline? Are we about to hit a crossover deadline where the legislation has to pass between two chambers? Does the legislation need to be reconciled? Um, because it wasn't the same in both chambers and they got amended or something like that. 
Um, so that's that's my general lay of the land on uh, on power mapping and and thinking through um, you know how you're going to work through the calendar um, and the process. Um, Petra, do you want me to talk about timeline now, or do you want me to wait and let you finish up with some of your stuff? You know, I think yeah, I'll go and I'll go and speak because I know your voice is a little. Yeah, well, I'll start speaking you. so your voice can have a break. And I know it's going to seem like we're going to be jumping around a lot, but again, like these are tried and true practices um, that even if folks aren't talking about that, that's what they're using, they're using it. I promise you, everybody's using these tools. So they're very um, helpful tools. So thank you for speaking on those things, Adam. And I love the way you kind of like, you know, broke it down from like this timeline that, you know, we get to see this, this step-by-step-by-step -by -step -by -step process. So thank you. <clears throat> so not unlike the power mapping that Adam spoke about, um, there's other power in your community that you might not already know exists. Some of you might already know exists. You might already have those relationships. You might not have those relationships. Um, there are community organizers. There are parents. There are teachers. There are um, faith leaders, faith groups, interfaith groups, um, so many different folks doing the work in public health, even though it's not necessarily explicitly public health, they are addressing the social determinants of health. And so making sure that you have a diversity of thought at the table, um, whether they're meeting together or they're meeting into small groups, um, it's really important to have that. Um, I think author and organizer Miriam Kava has said it best, Nothing that we do is worthwhile if it's done alone. Um, and rest is resistance. And sharing your power, sharing your resources, sharing your knowledge, um, and sharing the workload, um, it's natural. To, to hoard it all to yourself and to take it all onto yourself, um, that is going to overwhelm you. Um, it's going to overwhelm your immune system. It's going to overwhelm your mind. And in turn, those two things are connected. And so making sure that like you're redefining your goals and what success and failure looks like, your relationship with failure, your relationship with success. I know that's like a really hard struggle because a lot of us are doing this work and then we're doing additional work. And oftentimes the formal work that we do, it's, it's tied up in um, professionalism, it's tied up in goal setting, and those things aren't necessarily, um, they're not really necessarily conducive to human health. Like sometimes we just need to exist. <laughs> and so being able to prioritize um, the needs of the goals of the group, the cohesive unit that you'll be working in, um, is just, it's really important to kind of reframe that. Um, and I talk a lot about partnership and coalition um, engagement and collaborative uh, engagement and, and base building because those relationships will serve you, not just in the work that you're doing, but throughout your lifespan. Um, this work should be built and based off of your why. A lot of folks I know in, in our, our in-person um, meeting, we got to talk a lot about, you know, what drove you to do the work that you're doing, right? It's, it's often founded in your personal experiences. A lot of you folks could have done a lot of different things. We didn't get into public health for the money. We got into it because we care about things, right? And so, Remembering your why, letting your why be the locus of what's continuing to drive you in the relationships that you're going to build will always bring about genuine connections um, and, and allowing yourself to um, unlearn things and then learn new things is really integral when you are busting out of your um, social economies, because while I can definitely speak from like my own perspective, um, I know it really well. I have these experiences and these experiences are really important. Um, they're not happening in like just my community and those experiences of other communities that I'm not from are really important to have at the table and, and to speak with. So feeding yourself when the work is hard, mental health, um, prioritization and intention setting. Um, they shouldn't just be things that you do at the outright and the outset of the work, they should be something that you're constantly checking in on. And so I think that means that you often have something, like I know I need something in my calendar to remind me, get up and move. <laughs> 
make sure you're connecting with so-and-so. Um, they're a very good sounding board and make sure you're connecting with so-and-so because clearly I'm a good sounding board for them. Um, and always having that as part of like your itinerary of every connection that you have, um, it's just important. It's just like feeding yourself. It's just like watering your plants. It's just like walking your, your pets or, or pet, you know, spending time with your pets or your children, your, your loved ones. You have to do the same thing with the people that you work with. And they'll really kind of help you um, experience what we are going to consider a failure. Um, they're really going to kind of feed you and really nourish you when the times get really, really tough because it's not easy work, but it is empowering work. Um, and getting aligned with um, utilizing all the resources available to you and getting aligned with the partners that you have at the table to make sure that you're not just hoarding those resources, but you're sharing them when and where it's relevant and that they're also sharing those resources when and where it's relevant. Um, you want to move beyond the knowledge of, of all the things that you've been given through your experiences and your, your academic successes, your career successes, to that real life experience that you can't get in a book and that is through community engagement. Um, and so moving from that, we're gonna go ahead and jump right back to you, Adam, on your timeline of what it's gonna look like before, during, uh, before and during and after session or all yeah. the time. So we're gonna bring it on to you. Yeah, I just wanted to share a couple of stories uh, from, from Oklahoma. Uh, well, two from Oklahoma and one from Colorado. Um, so I was a legislative aide in Colorado in 2013, and I worked for a very moderate um, representative. She was in the most competitive district in the state, um, and we flipped her seat because she was very, very mindful of uh, striking, striking a good balance is how she thought about it. Um, she had a really interesting background. She was an attorney and a social worker. So people would read... <clears throat> on the power mapping that I told you earlier, would read that she was a social worker and would come to her um, with a social worker lens. And what was interesting about her is, I almost said her name, what was interesting about her is she said, I always ask social justice groups to give me an economic impact argument. And then I ask the people who are gonna give me an economic impact argument to give me a social justice argument. And I thought that was totally fascinating. So again, so you can you can know a lot about the biographical information, but you know people are still people and they're a little squirrely. Um, so we were uh, I was you know sitting there working in the office one day and um, you know there <clears throat> was legislation um, to stop foreclosures um, in in the Denver area um, because it was in the wake of the financial crisis and there was a lot of foreclosures going on and equity firms were going around and buying up a lot of property, pushing people out of their out of their homes. And there was legislation to try and decelerate, you know, this process and give people some uh, foreclosure relief. And she was a, a key vote. She was a key committee vote. <clears throat> and this coalition, um, one of the organizations in this coalition that was advocating um, for, uh, you know, some some extension on loan forgiveness, um, one of the organizations did a sit-in in our office. <laughs> and in Colorado, like. The legislators' offices are tiny. Like we were in a cubicle farm, um, so like our office was like ten feet by ten feet. Um, it was very very small, and their intention was to make us feel really uncomfortable. And the representative was like, "Yeah, so they're at the they're in the office with you right now." It's like, "Yeah, yeah." Again, the office is a very generous uh, phrasing. And um, you know the the purpose was she was like, "Okay, call call the sergeant at arms and have them removed." <laughs> so I have them removed. And they get the photo op that they wanted. And uh, one of the more moderate organizations within uh, the coalition is like, hey, you want to make sure that, you know, that doesn't happen again, that they don't keep, you know, kind of harassing you, you know. They piled up, piled up to us like buddies. Um, and yeah, and the representative I worked for was like, yes, I'll meet with you. Like, okay. And uh, so we meet and, you know, the amendments were made necessary for her to, you know, vote the way they wanted in committee, and 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 it goes on through the process. Well, anyway, come to find out, I end up working for one of those coalition organizations later after that legislative session, and come to find out that they deliver they deliberately planned that, like they sat at a conference table two weeks before they 
decided to do that. And they said, okay, you all are going to go into the office. You're going to get kicked out. Then we're going to come in later. Right. So when Petra talks about sharing power, it's also being knowing, knowing how you're being perceived, right. And using that to your advantage, um, using the assumptions people make about us to our advantage. The other thing I would just say on the calendar is if you have a lot of legislative priorities, <clears throat> like after we won marriage equality nationwide in Oklahoma, there were 30 plus anti LGBTQ bills introduced the year after. And there was no way to prioritize except to only prioritize them as they came up in the calendar. Um, so that was definitely my, my lived experience there. The third story that I want to share with you is there was a piece of legislation that's anti-LGBTQ bathroom bill. And we knew that it was going to pass. All of our whip count said it, our power mapping said it, the momentum was there, we didn't have the corporate folks on board, you know, there's backlash against woke corporations, air quotes. And I, I just said, you know, to our executive director at the time, I said, look, you know, we're going to lose this vote, but they're going to have to look us in the eye while they do it. Like, we can't not be there. Um, so even in the, in the face of potentially losing, it's still just as important um, to show up. Uh, we want to talk a little bit about the timeline before, during, and after session. And I really think about this as almost like an academic calendar is, you know, we're in the winter right now. This is like the before period. We're just getting our legislative leaders lined up. People understand how their districts are gonna perform. Redistricting has happened, right? People are getting a better sense of what the next 10 years is gonna look like in their legislature. So before, in these before times, this is the time to have relationships, to start having introduction conversations, things like that, getting to know legislative staff, introducing yourselves even before um, they start getting filed. So you could just say, hey, I'm here as a resource. You know, here are some priorities that we're really thinking about. Please, you know, call on us at any time just to get those um, relationships started. And um, in Utah and the LGBTQ community, they do fireside chats with legislative leaders. And that's how they've worked on legislative leaders in the Mormon church to come out and support marriage equality. Um, so it really does work. During session, it's just all about, you know, the points on the board. That's, that's when we have to be really mindful, like Petra was saying, about coalition priorities, about everybody being clear about what success looks like for them. Success for one organization might look different than success for another organization, but where the Venn diagram aligns, that's where we can work together. You know, for me, my number one rule in coalition building is do no harm. I don't want to be in coalition with somebody who's going to, like, to me, you know, I'm trans, so like, you know, do LGB policy and then like send the trans people, <laughs> right? So I really think about, you know, what my bottom lines are, but if there's somebody who's like in some way aligned with me and they're gonna be thoughtful about not doing harm, then they're probably a coalition partner and we can work on the areas where we have a lot of commonality. After session, that's when we're really thinking about what's gonna happen during the electoral season. You know, people tend to kind of take August off August is a really good time for strategic planning and thinking about what's gonna happen in September, October, November as we go into the electoral season. So those different activities at different points in the cycle of the campaign and of the calendar can really inform the type of activities that you do. Um, it allows us to plan out when our peaks are gonna be so that we can plan our workloads. I mean, we're only gonna be able to plan like 80% of our work when it comes to the stuff we do have to be flexible. It is exhausting. But some of it we can predict. So I would encourage you all to try to get, you know, some of it down and just know week by week, this is generally what's gonna happen. And then it allows us some time to lay the landscape for coalition partners. So everybody's working off the same page. Petra started the beginning of the session talking about, you know, how there are people in the media who misrepresent trans issues, right? One of the tactics that we could do around that is just have a briefing for media about like, here's how to, uh, cover trans things without being like a jerk, right? And like, we know you wanna do better. So like, we're here to help you do better, right? So there's a lot of like off the record and prep work that we could be doing. So those are some things I would say on timeline and, um, and accuracy, yeah. It's just, um, you know, and planning in, you know, these sprints, these like six to eight week sprints and letting people know, you know, what, what the work needs to look like at that time. and and being flexible, it gives us a roadmap to work off of instead of just saying, oh, we can never sit down and plan because we go from legislative season to 
election season and you know we always have whiplash so those are some thoughts on uh, how to manage the the year-round calendar as well as the legislative calendar um Thanks, yeah go ahead I was going to say, I love that you're bringing up the media like roundtables. We're doing one on housing because <laughs> we've seen some really misinformed ways of talking about housing as like a public health and safety issue. And so, you know, we want to make sure like media is representing that. The same thing goes for public health authority, right? Like even saying authority, that can be very intimidating, especially for people of color. Like nobody wants to hear that like at all in our neighborhood. We hear authority and we're like, don't speak up, don't say anything. And then others are like, no, we're going to push back against it. And it's it's a very like understandable, reflexive action from communities of color because of the fact that we've never been seen and when we have been seen by public health it's been not in a good way um so I'm really glad that you're also doing those kind of media and round tables because this is life-saving stuff this is very life-saving stuff um I think we have some time for questions right I think we're at a point where we can start diving into questions I'd love to share more stories but I would more I would love it more to hear, you know, what questions you folks have or what experiences you have and you'd like to share. Ryan, did you see anything sticking out in the chat, by the way? Did you see anything? Um, no questions yet in the chat, although I will keep an eye on it. Um, we did have one question from the Q&A that was submitted previously. Um, I guess kind of to summarize this question that's up on the screen here, um, just about how public health associations can prioritize the different areas of importance um, or impact in their communities and then um, use those to kind of turn those into focus for advocacy efforts. So um, if you wanted to reflect on answers to that question while we wait for others. Yeah, I would say, you know, um, it's obviously we're talking about also with affiliates that also have sub members too. <laughs> so it gets complicated because um, there's it's a political thing. So I just wanna recognize that and allow that. Um, and big cities, squish small guys, it, it happens. Um, but if you have community needs assessments or anything that is demonstrable about where you know um, resources need to be going, having that be a, a guiding uh, you know, guiding light can be really helpful. Um, for Oklahoma, we, uh, for the Oklahoma City County Health Department, we really care about TSET, which is the Tobacco Settlement Endowment Trust. Um, we really um, pay a lot of attention to how those resources get allocated because that funds our total wellness program. Our total wellness program is um, research-based, quantitative and qualitative research on public health outcomes in the, you know, in the areas where we have the most detrimental um, health outcomes. And not surprisingly, those are also our lowest um, income earning zip codes. Um, so that tends to be a lot of our frame, but then things where, you know, legislation threatens our existential existence, that shoots up to the top of the list. Um, so that's that's a little bit of the metric that that we use. I think those metrics are great. And I've heard a lot of that too from like a lot of the public health partners that I've worked with um, and that are in organizing with me on the ground. Cause again, I'm coming from an organizer perspective, um, policy engagement lead specialist and, and social determinants of health specialist. So, um, you know, I think some of it from what I've, I've understood and what I've experienced even in my own organizing work is if you don't see those priorities popping up, you have to have those conversations with those that you work with too. Um, especially in the LGBTQI space, right? Um, I think a lot about our relationships that we have in Pima County, which is where Tucson is at, our former capital. Um, and they they're just they've progressed so much. They've done so much work um, because of their their deeper history. You know, Arizona is a very brand new place. <laughs> um, Phoenix is a brand new place, and and it's a very big melting pot as well. And so I think. Um, you know, if you're not seeing the topics being explored or explored, or you're not seeing a diversity of priorities that you could potentially pick from, um, again, I think it's just really getting to know the communities that you're working in um, 
forming those relationships, um, making sure that the decisions are being driven by the community as well, um, centering them in their efforts and their solutions while bringing your expertise as someone who is an expert in public health to essentially serve their expertise in their life experiences and their communal experiences. Um, and I think always looking for the long-term solutions, um, knowing that they're not gonna necessarily be easily received because they're not necessarily the most profitable, um, but understanding that they're also not something that we may very well see in our own lifetime. Um, because I understand that a lot of the work that um, came our way on the, um, the ban on conversion therapy um, in Pima County that was informed by our public health uh, experts, um, that was that was decades in the making. That was not just something that someone said, we're going to do this and we're going to do it now. It was a lot of ongoing conversations. And I'm sure prior to us even getting into that work um, and the partners that I have getting into that work, uh, understanding that it did start with a simple conversation of people having it internally going, I think this is something that we need to talk about. And I think this is something that we need to prioritize. And then utilizing the resources that you have to understand like where the person's coming from to make sure that the words land and they plant the seeds of the things that we need to get done. So. Thank you so much for, for both of your comments on this question. Um, I think it, you know, we're hearing that there's definitely things that you can utilize and tools that are existing that, that do kind of prioritize on a community level um, where there is, you know, where there can be impact and where there is potentially uh, need for support, but ultimately it's good to make sure that you're um, aware of how actual community members feel about those things as well. Um, alrighty, so I did not yet see anything in the chat. However, folks have plenty of chance to add anything they'd like to add. Perfect. And Mackenzie has her hand up. So go ahead, Mackenzie, with your question. Perfect. Yeah. Um, thank y'all for hosting this and being um, incredible speakers. I've loved learning from y'all thus far, and I'm excited to keep learning from y'all. And so something, um, especially Petra, I heard you saying is to make sure that you're not doing this work yourself. Um, and I've heard that from other people on this call. How do we, um, like as coalition builders, especially in new environments, um, or getting, for in my case, new to this work, how do we make sure to um, push, you know, bring other people in to be involved in that? Because in my head, I'm like, oh, should I start making an Excel sheet with all these people and all their interests and all the, and like, that's not practical and that shouldn't be the work that I'm doing because that's not, that's not um, the work that should be done and that's not the best way to do it. So I'd love to hear how y'all recommend um, to keep track of that and then to get others involved so it's not just one person doing all this work. That's a really great question. And I think like, I think again, it's that reframing ourselves to like that professionalism and that perfectionism because it's not always gonna be perfect. Like, and you gotta throw it away and it's not fun, especially for those of us who've been in academia, especially the sciences are like, we need this. We need this very like black and white. Like we need this very concrete um, answer. And it's just, it's not always gonna be that concrete and it's gonna be different for all of us. But I think some of like the, the tried and true things are is again like making sure that the relationships are founded in in something genuine that that you can connect with other people in um and even if you can't connect with people we have a lot of level of like uh, what is it empathy and sympathy um and so you already have the social economy that you're in right my social economy is gonna look very different than yours um the people in my social economy will most likely have similar, um, th they might have someone who kind of breaks free of, of who's in my own and being able to kind of trust those who I work with and say, hey, like, I've seen this work happening. I've paid attention to the landscape or I've heard certain groups doing this kind of work. Like, I really kind of want to bring them into the fold, but I don't want to add to their capa uh, uh, burden and burn them out and add to their their minimal capacity and their their very large workload. Um, so I think it's also understanding that not, I think it's also understanding that they are most likely already doing the work. And I say that a lot because a lot of the things that are in public health explicitly, they align with things that are happening that organizers are doing in the ground. So like I think of economic justice, I think of labor unions a lot 
<laughs> they're doing a lot when it comes to health, right? They're really pushing back um, against economic burdens and economic strains and economic injustice. Um, and, and folks in health and folks in health sciences understand that like when you have more access to resources and the communities that have the most access to resources are indeed the safest. Um, so knowing like the people that are already doing the work, being able to meet them where they're at and go, hey, like, you may not see the work you're doing as public health is public health, but but it is, and and this is why I know it, and sharing that with them, and they'll they'll collaborate however they want to collaborate. Some people are going to be more invested in the work in different ways, and just kind of understanding what those relationships are going to look like, and and what you're going to get out of them, and what you're going to give to them, um, is always really important to kind of assess. But I'd say throw perfectionism away. Like, don't expect perfectionism. It's it's not going to be perfect. So, and that's okay. Yeah, and Petra, oh yeah, go ahead. I was just gonna draw attention to the question in the chat, which is very similar to what Petra was just talking about, um, kind of about what education and academia is doing to improve community health. And um, as some of the examples that you're throwing out there, Petra, it would be interesting to hear your reflections on on that kind of partnership as well. But go ahead, Adam. Um, I would just say also, the spreadsheet is great. And mapping your folks is great. What's more important, almost, I wouldn't say more important, what the next step is, is to get the person you're meeting with on your spreadsheet to do their spreadsheet. And then to have the people with them do their spreadsheet, right? Because we wanna build momentum. And so there's the idea of like a snowflake, you know, you get a snowball by having magnitude, that's how snow grows, is, you know, if you're meeting with a friendly state representative, you go great, representative, Beyonce, who else do you know that should be involved in this part of this conversation? And they might say, well, you need to talk to city councilor Jay-Z and you need to make sure that you're talking to, you know, X, Y, Z, who I have relationships with. And then you have to say, great, will you start the introduction and the conversation and tell them why you're involved with us? And that's where we develop our power. Um, because then we're, like um, Petra was saying, you know, we're using their social capital um, into our cause. And it's lending us, it's lending the person who's unlikely to support us, but our friend thinks their target, I shouldn't say target, thinks that they're the next person we should talk to. Sorry, I'm trying to like demilitarize how I talk about these things. Um, but right, so like, it also gives permission to the person who might not necessarily be super warm to our approach to be like, oh, well, this person's approaching me and we have a good relationship and maybe I'll consider it because it's coming from them. And it has credibility as a result of that. Um, so yeah, like, you know, I have my list of folks that I'm reaching out into, into our state. So we both live in the same state. Um, but then it's like, okay, now hearing what I've told you about everything that we've got going on, here's my list and I show them the list because again, transparency builds trust. Who's missing? And who's missing that you have a relationship that I should talk to? Because sometimes people will tell you this person's missing, but I'm not the person to talk to them. And then as you have those conversations, you could just keep comparing notes. Okay, you know, this person got added, you know, I, I need to go talk to them, but I don't have a relationship to them yet. I don't have the right path to them yet. And through our work, it will open up. Thank you both. Um, and so back to the question that Iman put into the, the chat, which is great. I know I've talked about it a lot at length. I was a GAP student. I went back to school a lot later in life. I am a biracial person. <laughs> I'm a, I am a detribalized indigenous person. And um, I think like academia has always been something that like I really valued, especially since when you come from um, migrant communities and migrant families, um, they really prioritize uh, an education, right? Like your family is gonna constantly push that on you, but without ever understanding that like these systems were always built for not people who are not white men in mind. <laughs> And so um, being able to kind of like have conversations and meet other academics, going back into my own um, social economy, considering I went to school with a lot of people who went into the medical field in different ways, um, is really important to kind of, you know, always foster those relationships, know that those relationships, while we do value data and accuracy, 
um, always being able to kind of like question and use that critical thinking that we were pushed to use when we were thinking of prescriptions, when we were thinking of um, health assessments, when we were thinking of uh, diagnoses. And, um, and I think, you know, the solutions are often a lot more simple. Um, it, it's, I shouldn't say they're, they're a lot more simple. They're simple and yet they're complex. They're simple in that um, they're community driven and they're driven by, I would say, you know, th those answers and those improvements are driven the, the best by black women. Like if you are struggling to be equitable, you need to prioritize black women and you need to let them lead. Um, if you don't have black women leading in your space, um, you need to show up for them. <laughs> like that's just like a hundred percent. You need to show up for them. Um, because a lot of black women are, are entering academia. They've been entering academia and they have been proving that academia does not see them. Um, and they're making it see them and they're bringing answers to the table that like I could never bring because I'm not a black woman. Um, and Black women see a lot of the disparities um, because they are heads of households, they're heads of families, they're heads of communities. Um, and so you just essentially bring your academia and your knowledge and your understanding, you learn from Black women, and you also unlearn from the things that you were taught um, in schools. And so it's, it's a balance. It's always a balance. So I always say throw away perfectionism, <laughs> be comfortable with, fail with failure, destigmatize that. Um, and trust black women, like 100% trust them. Great. Um, I, I think that those are really important points and it's important to value folks who are doing the work and, um, and make sure that they're compensated for that work. Um, on that note, thank you so much, everybody. Really appreciate your joining today. Um, we've got a little QR code up on the screen with some additional resources. I will send these slides as well as um, the recording for today's session out, um, and I can also attach the, the resource document that's linked here. Um, thank you, everybody, for coming. It was a wonderful session. We appreciate your time today, and, and thank you again to Petra and Adam.